Hello, everyone, and welcome to Great Souls, great stories presented by The Seagull Project. We are a short story podcast bringing you the best of literature read by a bevy of awesome professional actors. And I'm your host, Gavin Reed, artistic director of The Seagull Project and consumer of many short stories. This episode marks a return to the bread and butter of our company, Russian Literature. A company founded on the works of Anton Chekhov, we are no stranger to the Russian canon, and while we love to present stories from around the world, it feels good to dip back into the vast frozen north, especially in the wintertime. Today's episode is Great Souls, the Russian Troika. For those unfamiliar of the classic Russian speedster, a troika is a traditional Russian three-horse sleigh, and we have three of the strongest Russian horses, I mean, riders, of all time driving this podcast into the night. Stories by Leo Tolstoy, Anton Chekhov, and Vladimir Nabokov make up our audio sleigh and together represent 100 years of Russian literature. The grand vastness of the canon of Russian literature falls across a massive amount of styles, intentions, politics, and structures. While it's a generally simplistic way to look at it, the most famous periods of the Russian canon are generally separated into two groups, Golden and Silver Age. The Golden Age starts with the lush poetry of the early 19th century, headlined by Pushkin, and continues into some of the greatest prose writers of all time, including Dostoevsky, Gogol, Turgenev, our episode's own Tolstoy, and, depending on how you split it, perhaps Chekhov as well. More on that in a bit. Today, we get to dip into each of those ages, and we take a trip beyond as well. Anyway, what good is a troika unless we get to take a ride? So, let's get on to the stories. If you are looking for a specific story, then you will find timestamps in the description where you found this episode. As always, these stories are read by professional artists who are all paid for their work, and then released free of charge by The Seagull Project. That means we are only able to do that thanks to your support. If you liked the episode, we'd appreciate it if you made a donation or sent us a tip using the link where you found this episode. Or head to our website, www.theseagullproject.org. Also, be sure to give this podcast a follow, like the episode, and share with all your friends. Up first, we have a story originally published on Christmas Day in 1886. Vanka by Anton Chekhov is read by Alexandra Tavares. Nine-year-old Vanka Zukal, who was apprenticed three months ago to the shoemaker Alyakin, did not go to bed on Christmas Eve. He waited till the master and mistress and the more senior apprentices had gone to the early service, and then he took a bottle of ink and a pen with a rusty nib from his master's cupboard and began to write on a crumpled sheet of paper spread out in front of him. Before tracing the shape of the first letter, he looked several times fearfully in the direction of the doors and windows, and then he gazed up at the dark icon flanked on either side by shelves filled with cobbler's lasts, and then he heaved a broken sigh. With the paper spread over the bench, Vanka knelt on the floor beside it. Dear Grandfather Konstantin Makarich, he wrote, I am writing a letter to you. I wish you a Merry Christmas and all good things from the Lord God. I have no father and mother, and you are all I have left. Vanka raised his eyes to the dark window pane on which there gleamed the reflection of a candle flame, and in his vivid imagination he saw his grandfather, Konstantin Makarich, standing there. His grandfather was a night watchman on the estate of some gentlefolk called Jivadyov, a small, thin, unusually lively and nimble old man of about sixty-five, his face always crinkled with laughter and his eyes bleary from drink. In the daytime, the old man slept in the servant's kitchen or cracked jokes with the cooks. At night, wrapped in an ample sheepskin coat, he made the rounds of the estate, shaking his clapper. Two dogs followed him with drooping heads. One was the old bitch, Brownie, 
The other was called Eel because of his black coat and long, weasley body. Eel always seemed to be extraordinarily respectful and endearing, gazing with the same fond eyes on friends and strangers alike, yet no one trusted him. His deference and humility concealed the most Jesuitical malice. No one knew better how to creep stealthily behind someone and take a nip at his leg, or how to crawl into the ice house, or how to scamper off with a peasant's chicken. More than once they just about broke his hind legs. Twice a noose was put around his neck, and every week he was beaten until he was only half alive, yet he always managed to survive. At this very moment, Grandfather was probably standing by the gates, screwing up his eyes at the bright red windows of the village church, stamping about in his felt boots and cracking jokes with the servants. His clapper hung from his belt. He would be throwing out his arms and then hugging himself against the cold and hiccuping as old men do. He would be pinching one of the servants' girls or one of the cooks. What about a pinch of snuff, eh? He would say, holding his snuff box to the women. Then the women would take a pinch and sneeze, and the old man would be overcome with indescribable ecstasies, laughing joyously and exclaiming, Fine for frozen noses, eh? The dogs, too, were given snuff. Brownie would sneeze, shake her head, and walk away, looking offended, while Eel, too polite to sneeze, only wagged his tail. The weather was glorious. The air was still transparently clear and fresh. The night was very dark, but the whole white-roofed village with its snow drifts and trees silvered with hoarfrost and smoke streaming from the chimneys could be seen clearly. The heavens were sprinkled with gay, glinting stars, and the Milky Way stood out as clear as if it had been washed and scrubbed with snow for the holidays. Vanka sighed dipped his pen in the ink, and went on writing. Yesterday I was given a thrashing. The master dragged me by the hair into the yard and gave me a beating with a stirrup strap because I was rocking the baby in the cradle, and I misfortunately fell asleep. And then last week the mistress ordered me to gut a herring, and because I began with the tail, she took the head of the herring and rubbed it all over my face. The other apprentices made fun of me, sent me to the tavern for vodka, and made me steal the master's cucumbers for them. And then the master beat me with the first thing that came to hand. And there's nothing to eat. In the morning, they give me bread. There is porridge for dinner. And in the evening, only bread again. They never give me tea or cabbage soup. They gobble it all up themselves. They make me sleep in the passageway, and then their baby cries, and I don't get any sleep at all because I have to rock the cradle. Dear Grandfather, please, for God's sake, take me away from here. Take me to the village. It's more than I could bear. I kneel down before you. I'll pray to God to keep you forever. But take me away from here or I shall die. Vanka grimaced, rubbed his eyes with his black fist and sobbed. I'll grind your snuff for you. He went on, I will pray to God to keep you, and if I ever do anything wrong, you can flog me all you like. If you think there's no place for me, then I'll ask the manager, for Christ's sake, to let me clean boots or take Vetya's place as a shepherd's boy. Dear Grandfather, it's more than I can bear. It will be the death of me. I thought of running away to the village, but I haven't any boots, and I am afraid of the ice. If you'll do this for me... I'll feed you when I grow up and won't let anyone harm you. And when you die, I'll pray for the repose of your soul, just like I do for my mother, Pelagea. Moscow is such a big city. There are so many houses belonging to the gentry, so many horses, but no sheep anywhere, and the dogs aren't vicious. The boys don't go about with a star of Christmas, and they don't let you sing in the choir. And once I saw fish hooks in the shop window with the fish lines for every kind of fish, very fine ones, even one hook which would hold a skate fish weighing 40 pounds. I've seen shops selling guns, which are just like the masters at home. Each one costs a hundred rubles. In the butcher's shop, they have woodcocks and partridges and hares, but people in the shop won't tell you where they were shot. Dear Grandfather, when they put up the Christmas tree at the big house, please 
take down a golden walnut for me and hide it in the green chest? Ask the young mistress Olga Ignatyevna and say it is for Vanka. Vanka heaved a convulsive sigh. And once again, he gazed in the direction of the window. He remembered it was grandfather who always went to the forest to cut down a Christmas tree for the gentry, taking his grandson with him. They had a wonderful time together. Grandfather chuckled, the frost crackled, and Vanka, not to be outdone, clucked away cheerfully. Before chopping down the fir tree, grandfather would smoke a pipe, take a long pinch of snuff, and make fun of Vanka, who was shivering in the cold. The young fir trees, garlanded with hoarfrost, stood perfectly still, waiting to see which of them would die. Suddenly, out of nowhere, a hare came springing across the snowdrifts quick as an arrow, and Grandfather would be unable to prevent himself from shouting, Hold him! Hold him! Hold that bobtailed devil, eh? When the tree had been chopped down, Grandfather would drag it to the big house, and they would start decorating it. The young mistress, Olga Ignatyevna, Vanka's favorite, was the busiest of all. While Vanka's mother, Pelageya, was alive, serving as a chambermaid, Olga Ignatyevna used to stuff him with sugar candy, and it amused her to teach him to read and write, to count up to a hundred, and even to dance the quadrille. But when Pelageya died, they relegated the orphan Vanka to the servant's kitchen to be with his grandfather, and from there he went to Moscow, to the shoemaker, Alyakin. Come to me, dear grandfather, Vanka went on. I beseech you, for Christ's sake, take me away from here. Have pity on me, a poor orphan. They are always beating me, and I am terribly hungry and so miserable I can't tell you, and I am always crying. The other day the master hit me on the head with a last, and I fell down and thought I would never get up again. It's worse than a dog's life, and so miserable. I send greetings to Alyona, to Wanai Yegor, and to the coachman, and don't give my harmonica away. I remain your grandson, Ivan Zukov, dear grandfather, and come soon. Vanka folded the sheet of paper, and then he put it in an envelope bought the previous day for a kopeck. He reflected for a while dipped the pen in the ink and wrote the address to Grandfather in the Village. Then he scratched his head and thought for a while and added the words Konstantin Makarich. Pleased because no one interrupted him when he was writing, he threw on his cap and without troubling to put on a coat, he ran out into the street in his shirt sleeves. When he talked to the clerks in the butcher shop the previous day, they told him that letters were dropped in boxes. And from these boxes, they were carried all over the world in mail coaches drawn by three horses and driven by drunken drivers while the bells jingled. Bunker ran to the nearest mailbox and thrust his precious letter into the slot. An hour later, lulled, by sweetest hope, he was fast asleep. He dreamed of a stove. His grandfather was sitting on the stove, bare feet dangling down, while he read the letter out loud to the cooks. Eel was walking around the stove, wagging his tail. I was originally taught that Chekhov was part of the Silver Age of Russian literature, but it seems that since he was writing at the tail end of the 19th century, he is often lumped in with the Golden Age writers. Personally, I think his writing is so different and so entrenched in the modern era that I have a tough time putting him in the same box as Turgenev. Maybe Dostoevsky and his intense moral grayness, but I don't know. Let's just admit that he straddled it the rising voice of a new perspective of Russian. Chekhov died at the age of 44 from tuberculosis in 1904. The harbinger of a world on the brink flipped over just years after his death. A literary prophet foretelling the rise of a new Russia 
taken before his grand accomplishments could meet their final conclusion, perhaps deserving an age of his own. Vladimir Nabokov, on the other hand, was only five when Chekhov passed and would be greatly impacted by this new Russia. Born into an old aristocratic family in St. Petersburg, Nabokov would be gifted his family estate in 1916, only to be forced to give it up and flee the country with his family a year later, after the 1917 revolution. Nabokov would go on to be recognized as one of the many émigré writers to emerge from Russia during this period. That estate would go on to be Nabokov's only permanent home in his life. Bouncing from Russia to the Ukraine to England, Germany, France, and finally the United States, where he would become a citizen in 1945, before returning to Europe for the last years of his life. From the time of the loss of his home in Russia, Nabokov's only attachment was to what he termed the unreal estate of memory and art. He never purchased a house, preferring instead to live in houses rented from other professors on sabbatical leave. Even after great wealth came to him with the success of Lolita and the subsequent interest in his previous work, Nabokov and his family chose to live in a Swiss hotel. He wrote this next piece while living in Germany in 1937, just before he would be forced to move to France and then to the United States as the Nazis came to power. I'd say this story reflects his state of mind at that time quite well. Please enjoy Cloud Castle Lake by Vladimir Nabokov, as read by Rob Burgess. One of my representatives, a modest, mild bachelor, very efficient, happened to win a pleasure trip at a charity ball given by Russian refugees. That was in 1936 or 1937. The Berlin summer was in full flood. It was the second week of damp and cold, so that it was a pity to look at everything which had turned green and vain, and only the sparrows kept cheerful. He did not care to go anywhere, but when he tried to sell his ticket at the office of the Bureau of Pleasant Trips, he was told that to do so he would have to have special permission from the Ministry of Transportation. When he tried them, it turned out that first he would have to draw up a complicated petition at a notary's on stamped paper, and besides, a so-called certificate of non-absence from the city for the summertime had to be obtained from the police. So he sighed a little and decided to go. He borrowed an aluminum flask from friends, repaired his soles, bought a belt and a fancy-style flannel shirt, one of those cowardly things which shrink in the first wash. Incidentally, it was too large for that likable little man. <laughs> his hair always neatly trimmed, his eyes so intelligent and kind. I, I cannot remember his name at the moment. Oh, I think it was Vasily Ivanovich. He slept badly the night before the departure. And why? Because he had to get up unusually early, and hence took along into his dreams the delicate face of the watch ticking on his night table. But mainly because that very night, for no reason at all, he began to imagine that this trip thrust upon him by a feminine fate in a low-cut gown, this trip which he had accepted so reluctantly, would bring him some wonderful, tremulous happiness. This happiness would have something in common with his childhood, and with the excitement aroused in him by Russian lyrical poetry, and with some evening skyline once seen in a dream, and with that lady, another man's wife, whom he had hopelessly loved for seven years. But it would be even fuller and more significant than all that. And besides, he felt that the really good life must be oriented towards something or someone. The morning was dull, but steam warm and close, with an inner sun, and it was quite pleasant to rattle in a streetcar to the distant railway station where the gathering place was. Several people, alas, were taking part in the excursion. Who would they be, these drowsy beings, drowsy as seem all creatures still unknown to us? By window number six, at 7 a.m., as was indicated in the directions appended to the ticket, he saw them. They were already waiting. 
he had managed to be late by about three minutes. A lanky, blonde young man in Tyrolese garb stood out at once. He was burned the color of a coxcomb, had huge brick-red knees with golden hairs, and his nose looked lacquered. He was the leader, furnished by the Bureau, and as soon as the newcomer had joined the group, which consisted of four women and as many men, he led it off toward a train lurking behind other trains, carrying his monstrous knapsack with terrifying ease, and firmly clanking with his hobnailed boots. Everyone found a place in an empty car, unmestakably third class, and Vasily Ivanovich, having sat down by himself and put a peppermint into his mouth, immediately opened a little volume of Chuchev, whom he had long intended to reread, but he was requested to put the book aside and join the group. An elderly, bespectacled post-office clerk, with skull, chin, and upper lip a bristly blue, as if he had shaved off some extraordinary luxuriant and tough growth, especially for this trip, immediately announced that he had been to Russia and knew some Russian. For instance, Potts Louis, and recalling philanderings and Tsaritsyn, winked in such a manner that his fat wife sketched out in the air the preface of a backhand box on the ear. The company was getting noisy. Four employees of the same building firm were tossing each other heavyweight jokes. A middle-aged man, Schultz, a younger man, Schultz, also, and two fidgety young women with big mouths and big rumps. The red-headed, rather burlesque widow in a sports skirt knew something, too, about Russia. The Riga beaches. There was also a dark young man by the name of Shram, with lusterless eyes and a vague velvety vileness about his person and manners, who constantly switched the conversation to this or that attractive aspect of the excursion, and who gave the first signal for rapturous appreciation. <laughs> he was, as it turned out later, a special stimulator for the Bureau of Pleasant Trips. The locomotive, working rapidly with its elbows, hurried through a pine forest, then, with relief, among fields, only dimly realizing as yet all the absurdity and horror of the situation, and perhaps attempting to persuade himself that everything was very nice, Vasily Ivanovich contrived to enjoy the fleeting gifts of the road. And indeed, how enticing it all is! What charm the world acquires when it is wound up and moving like a merry-go-round! The burning sun crept toward a corner of the window and suddenly spilled over the yellow bench. The badly pressed shadow of the car sped madly along the grassy bank where flowers blended into colored streaks. A crossing, a cyclist was waiting, one foot resting on the ground. Trees appeared in groups and singly, revolving coolly and blandly, displaying the latest fashions. The blue dampness of a ravine, a memory of love disguised as a meadow, Wispy clouds, greyhounds of heaven. Oh, we both, Vasily Ivanovich and I, have always been impressed by the anonymity of all the parts of a landscape. So dangerous for the soul. The impossibility of ever finding out where that path you see leads. And look, what a tempting thicket! It happened that on a distant slope or in a gap in the trees, there would appear and, as it were, stop for an instant, like air retained in the lungs, a spot so enchanting, a lawn, a terrace, such perfect expression of tender, well-meaning beauty, that it seemed that if one could stop the train and go thither forever, to you, my love... But a thousand beech trunks were already madly leaping by, whirling in a sizzling sun pool, and again the chance for happiness was gone. At the stations, Vasily Ivanovich would look at the configuration of some entirely insignificant objects, a smear on the platform, a, a cherry stone, a cigarette butt, and would say to himself that never, never would he remember these three little things here, in that particular interrelation, this pattern which he could now see with such deathless precision or again looking at a group of children waiting for a train he would try with all his might to single out at least one remarkable destiny in the form of a violin or a crown a propeller or a mandolin and would gaze until the whole party of village schoolboys appeared as on an old photograph 
now reproduced with a little white cross above the face of the last boy on the right, the hero's childhood. But one could look out the window only by snatches. All had been given sheet music with verses from the bureau. Stop that worrying and moping, take a knotted stick and rise. Come a tramping in the open with the good, the hearty guys. Tramp your country's grass and stubble with the good, the hearty guys. Kill the hermit and his trouble and to hell with doubts and sighs. In a paradise of heather where the field mouse screams and dies, let us march and sweat together with the steel and leather guys. This was to be sung in chorus. Vasily Ivanovich, who not only could not sing, but could not even pronounce German words clearly, took advantage of the drowning roar of mingling voices and merely opened his mouth while swaying slightly, as if he were really singing. But the leader, at a sign from the subtle Shram, suddenly stopped the general singing and, squinting askance at Vasily Ivanovich, demanded that he sing solo. Vasily Ivanovich cleared his throat, <clears throat> timidly began, and after a minute of solitary torment, all joined in, but he did not dare thereafter to drop out. He had with him his favorite cucumber from the Russian store, a loaf of bread, and three eggs. When evening came, and the low crimson sun entered wholly the soiled seasick car, stunned by its own din, all were invited to hand over their provisions, in order to divide them evenly. This was particularly easy, as all, except Vasily Ivanovich, had the same things. The cucumber amused everybody, was pronounced inedible, and was thrown out of the window. In view of the insufficiency of his contribution— Vasily Ivanovich got a smaller portion of sausage. He was made to play cards. They pulled him about, questioned him, verified whether he could show the route of the trip on the map. In a word, all busied themselves with him. At first good-naturedly, then with malevolence, which grew with the approach of night. Both girls were called Greta. The red-headed widow somehow resembled the rooster leader, Shram, Schultz, and the other Schultz, the post office clerk and his wife, all gradually melted together, merged together, forming one collective wobbly, many-handed being from which one could not escape. It pressed upon him from all sides. But suddenly, at some station, all climbed out, and it was already dark, although in the west there still hung a very long, very pink cloud, and... Farther along the track, with a soul-piercing light, the star of a lamp trembled through the slow smoke of the engine, and crickets chirped in the dark, and from somewhere there came the odor of jasmine and hay, my love. They spent the night in a tumble-down inn. A mature bedbug is awful, but there's a certain grace in the motions of silky wood lice. The post office clerk was separated from his wife, who was put with the widow, he was given to Vasily Ivanovich for the night. The two beds took up the whole room, quilt on top, chamber pots below. The clerk said that somehow he did not feel sleepy, and began to talk of his Russian adventures, rather more circumstantially than in the trade. He was a great bully of a man, thorough and obstinate, clad in long cotton drawers, with mother-of-pearl claws on his dirty toes, and bear's fur between fat breasts. A moth dashed about the ceiling, hobnobbing with its shadow. In Saritzen, the clerk was saying, there are now three schools, a German, a Czech, and a Chinese one. At any rate, that is what my brother-in-law says. <laughs> he went there to build tractors. Next day, from early morning to five o'clock in the afternoon, they raised dust along a highway which undulated from hill to hill. Then they took a green road through a dense fir wood. Vasily Ivanovich, as the least burdened, was given an enormous round loaf of bread to carry under his arm. How I hate you, our daily! But still his precious experienced eyes noted what was necessary. Against the background of a fir tree gloom, a dry needle was hanging vertically on an invisible thread. Again they piled into a train, and again the small partitionless car was empty. The other Schultz began to teach Vasily Ivanovich how to play the mandolin. There was much laughter. When they got tired of that, 
they thought up a capital game, which was supervised by Shram. It consisted of the following. The women would lie down on the benches they chose, under which the men were already hidden. And when from under one of the benches there would emerge a ruddy face with ears, or a big outspread hand with a skirt-lifting curve of the fingers, which would provoke much squealing, then it would be revealed who was paired off with whom. Three times Vasily Ivanovich lay down in filthy darkness, and three times it turned out that there was no one on the bench when he crawled out from under. He was acknowledged the loser, and was forced to eat a cigarette butt. They spent the night on straw mattresses in a barn, and early in the morning set out again on foot. Furs, ravines, foamy streams. From the heat, from the songs which one had to constantly bawl, Vasily Ivanovich became so exhausted that during the midday halt he fell asleep at once, and awoke only when they began to slap at imaginary horseflies on him. But after another hour of marching, that very happiness of which he had once half dreamt was suddenly discovered. It was a pure blue lake with an unusual expression of its water. In the middle, a large cloud was reflected in its entirety. On the side, on a hill thickly covered with verdure, and the darker the verdure, the more poetic it is, towered, arising from dactyl to dactyl, an ancient black castle. Of course, there are plenty of such views in Central Europe, but just this one, in the inexpressible and unique harmoniousness of its three principal parts, in its smile, in some mysterious innocence it had, my love, my obedient one, was something so unique and so familiar and so long promised, and it so understood the beholder that Vasily Ivanovich even pressed his hand to his heart, as if to see whether his heart was there in order to give it away. At some distance, Shram, poking into the air with the leader's alpenstock, was calling the attention of the excursionists to something or other. They had settled themselves around on the grass, in poses, seen in amateur snapshots, while the leader sat on a stump, his behind to the lake, and was having a snack. Quietly concealing himself in his own shadow, Vasily Ivanovich followed the shore and came to a kind of inn. A dog, still quite young, greeted him. It crept on its belly, its jaws laughing, its tail fervently beating the ground. Vasily Ivanovich accompanied the dog into the house. A piebald two-story dwelling with a winking window beneath a convex tiled eyelid. And he found the owner a tall old man vaguely resembling a Russian war veteran, who spoke German so poorly and was such a soft drawl that Vasily Ivanovich changed to his own tongue. But the man understood his inner dream and continued in the language of his environment, his family. Upstairs was a room for travelers. <sighs> you know, I shall take it for the rest of my life. Vasily Ivanovich is reported to have said as soon as he had entered it. The room itself had nothing remarkable about it. On the contrary, it was a most ordinary room, with a red floor, daisies daubed on the white walls, and a small mirror half filled with the yellow infusion of the reflected flowers. But from the window, one could clearly see the lake, with its cloud and its castle, in a motionless and perfect correlation of happiness. Without reasoning, without considering, only entirely surrendering to an attraction the truth of which consisted in its own strength, a strength which he had never experienced before, Vasily Ivanovich, in one radiant second, realized that here, in this little room, with that view, beautiful to the verge of tears, life would at last be what he had always wished it to be. What exactly it would be like, what, what would take place here, that of course he did not know, but all around him were help, promise, and consolation, so that there could be no doubt that he must live here. In a moment, he figured out how he would manage it so as not to have to return to Berlin again, how to get the few possessions that he had, books, the blue suit, her photograph. Oh, how simple it was turning out! As my representative, he was earning enough for the modest life of a refugee Russian. 
"'My friends!' he cried, having run down again to the meadow by the shore. "'My friends, good-bye. "'I shall remain for good in that house over there. "'We can't travel any longer. "'I shall go no farther. "'I am not going anywhere. "'Good-bye!' "'How is that?' said the leader in a queer voice after a short pause, during which the smile on the lips of Vasily Ivanovich slowly faded, while the people who had been sitting on the grass half rose and stared at him with stony eyes. "'But why?' he faltered. "'It is here that—' "'Silence!' the post-office clerk suddenly bellowed with an extraordinary force. "'Come to your senses, you drunken swine!' "'Wait the moment, gentlemen,' said the leader, "'and having passed his tongue over his lips, "'he turned to Vasily Ivanovich. "'You probably have been drinking,' he said quietly, "'or have gone out of your mind. "'You are taking a pleasure trip with us. Hmm? "'Tomorrow, according to the appointed itinerary, <laughs> "'look at your ticket, we are all returning to Berlin. "'There can be no question of any one. In this case, you, refusing to continue this communal journey. We were singing today a certain song. Try and remember what it said. That's enough now. Come, children. We are going on. There will be beer at Ewald, said Schramm in a caressing voice. Five hours by train. Hikes. A hunting lodge, coal mines, lots of interesting sinks. I shall complain, wailed Vasily Ivanovich. Give me back my bag. I have the right to remain where I want. Oh, but this is nothing less than an invitation to a beheading. He told me he cried when they seized him by the arms. If necessary, we shall carry you, said the leader grimly. But that is not likely to be pleasant for you. I am responsible for each of you, and shall bring back each of you. Alive or dead. Swept along a forest road as in a hideous fairy tale, squeezed, twisted, Vasily Ivanovich could not even turn around, and only felt how the radiance behind his back receded, fractured by trees, and then it was no longer there, and all around the dark firs fretted but could not interfere. As soon as everyone had got into the car and the train pulled out, they began to beat him. They beat him a long time, and with a good deal of inventiveness. It occurred to them, among other things, to use a corkscrew on his palms, then on his feet. The post office clerk, who had been to Russia, fashioned a knout out of a stick and a belt, and began to use it with devilish dexterity at a boy. The other men relied more on their iron heels, whereas the women were satisfied to pinch and slap. All had a wonderful time. After returning to Berlin, he called on me, was much changed, sat down quietly, putting his hands on his knees, told his story, kept on repeating that he must resign his position, begged me to let him go, insisted that he could not continue, that he had not the strength to belong to mankind any longer. Of course, I let him go. When people think about Russian literature, they usually think of its golden age. And when they think of the golden age, their minds tend to go right to Leo Tolstoy. He would become such a pinnacle of literature that Anton Chekhov, who often visited Tolstoy at his country estate, wrote, When literature possesses a Tolstoy, it is easy and pleasant to be a writer. Even when you know you have achieved nothing yourself and are still achieving nothing, this is not as terrible as it might otherwise be because Tolstoy achieves for everyone. What he does serves to justify all the hopes and aspirations invested in literature. Tolstoy received nominations for the Nobel Prize in Literature every year from 1902 to 1906, and for the Nobel Peace Prize in 1901, 1902, and 1909. That he never won is a major controversy. Born to an aristocratic family in 1828, Tolstoy is best known for the novels War and Peace and Anna Karenina. 
In the 1870s, Tolstoy experienced a profound moral crisis, followed by what he regarded as an equally profound spiritual awakening. His literal interpretation of the ethical teachings of Jesus, centering on the Sermon on the Mount, caused him to become a fervent Christian anarchist and pacifist. His ideas on nonviolent resistance had a profound impact on such pivotal 20th century figures as Mahatma Gandhi and Martin Luther King Jr. In 1872, just after that spiritual awakening, Tolstoy would write our next and final piece of the episode, a testament to his faith, pacifism, and moral philosophy. God Sees the Truth But Waits by Leo Tolstoy as read by Charles Leggett. In the town of Vladimir lived a young merchant named Ivan Dmitrich Askianov. He had two shops and a house of his own. Askianov was a handsome, fair-haired, curly-headed fellow, full of fun, and very fond of singing. When quite a young man, he had been given to drink, and was riotous when he had had too much, but after he married, he gave up drinking, except now and then. One summer, Askionov was going to the Nizhny Fair, and as he bade goodbye to his family, his wife said to him, Ivan Dmitrich, do not start today. I have had a bad dream about you. Askionov laughed and said, you are afraid that when I get to the fair I shall go on a spree. His wife replied, I do not know what I am afraid of. All I know is that I had a bad dream. I dreamed you returned from the town, and when you took off your cap I saw that your hair was quite gray. Askianov laughed. That's a lucky sign, said he. See if I don't sell out all my goods, and bring you some presents from the fair. So he said goodbye to his family and drove away. When he had traveled halfway, he met a merchant whom he knew, and they put up at the same inn for the night. They had some tea together and then went to bed in adjoining rooms. It was not Askianov's habit to sleep late, and wishing to travel while it was still cool, he aroused his driver before dawn and told him to put in the horses. Then he made his way across to the landlord of the inn, who lived in a cottage at the back, paid his bill, and continued his journey. When he had gone about twenty-five miles, he stopped for the horses to be fed. Askianov rested a while in the passage of the inn, then he stepped out into the porch, and, ordering a samovar to be heated, got out his guitar and began to play. Suddenly a troika drove up with tinkling bells, and an official alighted, followed by two soldiers. He came to Askianov and began to question him, asking him who he was and whence he came. Askianov answered him fully and said, Won't you have some tea with me? But the official went on cross-questioning him and asking him, Where did you spend last night? Were you alone or with a fellow merchant? Did you see the other merchant this morning? Why did you leave the inn before dawn? Askianov wondered why he was asked all these questions, but he described all that had happened and then added, Why do you cross-question me as if I were a thief or a robber? I am traveling on business of my own, and there is no need to question me. Then the official, calling the soldiers, said, I am the police officer of this district, and I question you because the merchant with whom you spent last night has been found with his throat cut. We must search your things. They entered the house. The soldiers and the police officer unstrapped Askianov's luggage and searched it. Suddenly the officer drew a knife out of a bag, crying, Whose knife is this? Askianov looked, and seeing a blood-stained knife taken from his bag, he was frightened. How is it there is blood on this knife? Askianov tried to answer, but could hardly utter a word, and only stammered, I don't know. Not mine. Then the police officer said, This morning the merchant was found in bed with his throat cut. You are the only person who could have done it. 
The house was locked from inside and no one else was there. Here's this blood-stained knife in your bag. And your face and manner betray you. Tell me how you killed him and how much money you stole. Askianov swore he had not done it, that he had not seen the merchant after they had had tea together, that he had no money except 8,000 rubles of his own, and that the knife was not his, but his voice was broken, his face pale, and he trembled with fear as though he were guilty. The police officer ordered the soldiers to bind Askianov and to put him in the cart. As they tied his feet together and flung him into the cart, Askianov crossed himself and wept. His money and goods were taken from him, and he was sent to the nearest town and imprisoned there. Inquiries as to his character were made in Vladimir. The merchants and other inhabitants of that town said that in former days he used to drink and waste his time, but that he was a good man. Then the trial came on. He was charged with murdering a merchant from Riazan and robbing him of 20,000 rubles. His wife was in despair and did not know what to believe. Her children were all quite small. One was a baby at her breast. Taking them all with her, she went to the town where her husband was in jail. At first she was not allowed to see him, but after much begging, she obtained permission from the officials and was taken to him. When she saw her husband in prison dress and in chains, shut up with thieves and criminals, she fell down and did not come to her senses for a long time. Then she drew her children to her and sat down near him. She told him of things at home and asked about what had happened to him. He told her all, and she asked, What can we do now? We must petition the Tsar not to let an innocent man perish. His wife told him that she had sent a petition to the Tsar, but it had not been accepted. Askianov did not reply, but only looked downcast. Then his wife said, It was not for nothing I dreamed your hair had turned gray. You remember, you should not have started that day. And passing her fingers through his hair, she said, Vanya, dearest, tell your wife the truth. Was it not you who did it? So you too suspect me, said Askionov, and hiding his face in his hands, he began to weep. Then a soldier came to say that the wife and children must go away, and Askianov said goodbye to his family for the last time. When they were gone, Askianov recalled what had been said, and when he remembered that his wife also had suspected him, he said to himself, It seems that only God can know the truth. It is to him alone we must appeal, and from him alone expect mercy. And Askianov wrote no more petitions, gave up all hope, and only prayed to God. Askianov was condemned to be flogged and sent to the mines. So he was flogged with a knout and when the wounds made by the knout were healed, he was driven to Siberia with other convicts. For twenty-six years, Askianov lived as a convict in Siberia. His hair turned white as snow, and his beard grew long, thin, and gray. All his mirth went. He stooped, he walked slowly, spoke little, and never laughed. But. He often prayed. In prison, Askianov learned to make boots and earned a little money, with which he bought Lives of the Saints. He read this book when there was light enough in the prison. 
and on Sundays in the prison church he read the lessons and sang in the choir, for his voice was still good. The prison authorities liked Askianov for his meekness, and his fellow prisoners respected him. They called him Grandfather and the Saint. When they wanted to petition the prison authorities about anything, they always made Askianov their spokesman, and when there were quarrels among the prisoners, they came to him to put things right and to judge the matter. No news reached Askianov from his home, and he did not even know if his wife and children were still alive. One day, a fresh gang of convicts came to the prison. In the evening, the old prisoners collected round the new ones and asked them what towns or villages they came from and what they were sentenced for. Among the rest, Askionov sat down near the newcomers and listened with downcast air to what was said. One of the new convicts, a tall, strong man of sixty with a closely cropped gray beard, was telling the others what he had been arrested for. Well, friends, he said, I only took a horse that was tied to a sledge, and I was arrested and accused of stealing. I said I had only taken it to get home quicker and had then let it go. Besides, the driver was a personal friend of mine. So I said, it's all right. No, said they, you stole it. But how or where I stole it, they could not say. I once really did something wrong and ought by rights to have come here long ago. But that time I was not found out. Now I have been sent here for nothing at all. Ah, but it's lies, I'm telling you. I've been to Siberia before, but I did not stay long. Where are you from? asked someone. From Vladimir. My family are of that town. My name is Makar, and they also call me Semyonich. Askionov raised his head and said, Tell me, Semyonich. Do you know anything of the merchants Askionov of Vladimir? Are they still alive? Know them? Of course I do. The Askionovs are rich. Though their father is in Siberia, a sinner like ourselves, it seems. As for you, Grandad, how did you come here? Askionov did not like to speak of his misfortune. He only sighed and said, for my sins. I have been in prison these twenty-six years. What sins? asked Makar Semyonich. But Askionov only said, Well, well, I must have deserved it. He would have said no more, but his companions told the newcomers how Askionov had come to be in Siberia, how someone had killed a merchant and had put the knife among Askionov's things, and Askionov had been unjustly condemned. When Makar Semyonich heard this, he looked at Askionov, slapped his own knee, and exclaimed, Well, this is wonderful, really wonderful! But how old you've grown, Grandad! The others asked him why he was so surprised, and where he had seen Askionov before, but Makar Semyonich did not reply. He only said, it's wonderful that we should meet here, lads. These words made Askionov wonder whether this man knew who had killed the merchant. So he said, Perhaps, Semyonich, you have heard of that affair, or maybe you've seen me before? How could I help hearing? The world's full of rumors. But it's a long time ago, and I've forgotten what I heard. Perhaps you heard who killed the merchant? asked Askionov. Makar Semyonich laughed and replied, It must have been him in whose bag the knife was found. If someone else hid the knife there, he's not a thief till he's caught, as the saying is. How could anyone put a knife into your bag while it was under your head? It would surely have woke you up. When Askionov heard these words, he felt sure this was the man who had killed the merchant. He rose and went away. 
All that night Askionov lay awake. He felt terribly unhappy, and all sorts of images rose in his mind. There was the image of his wife, as she was when he parted from her to go to the fair. He saw her as if she were present. Her face and her eyes rose before him. He heard her speak and laugh. Then he saw his children, quite little as they were at that time, one with a little cloak on, another at his mother's breast. And then he remembered himself as he used to be, young and merry. He remembered how he sat playing the guitar in the porch of the inn where he was arrested, and how free from care he had been. He saw in his mind the place where he was flogged, the executioner, and the people standing around, the chains, the convicts, all the twenty-six years of his prison life and his premature old age. The thought of it all made him so wretched that he was ready to kill himself. And it's all that villain's doing, thought Ostyanov. And his anger was so great against Makar Semyonich that he longed for vengeance, even if he himself should perish for it. He kept repeating prayers all night, but could get no peace. During the day, he did not go near Makar Semyonich, nor even look at him. A fortnight passed in this way. Askionov could not sleep at night and was so miserable that he did not know what to do. One night, as he was walking about the prison, he noticed some earth that came rolling out from under one of the shelves on which the prisoners slept. He stopped to see what it was. Suddenly Makar Semyonich crept out from under the shelf and looked up at Askionov with frightened face. Askionov tried to pass without looking at him, but Makar seized his hand and told him that he had dug a hole under the wall, getting rid of the earth by putting it into his high boots and emptying it out every day on the road when the prisoners were driven to their work. Just you keep quiet, old man, and you shall get out too. If you blab, they'll flog the life out of me, but I will kill you first. Askionov trembled with anger as he looked at his enemy. He drew his hand away, saying, I have no wish to escape, and you have no need to kill me. You killed me long ago. As to telling of you, I may do so or not, as God shall direct. Next day, when the convicts were led out to work, the convoy soldiers noticed that one or other of the prisoners emptied some earth out of his boots. The prison was searched and the tunnel found. The governor came and questioned all the prisoners to find out who had dug the hole. They all denied any knowledge of it. Those who knew would not betray Makar Semyonich, knowing he would be flogged almost to death. At last the governor turned to Askyonov, whom he knew to be a just man, and said, You are a truthful old man. Tell me, before God, who dug the hole? Makar Semyonich stood as if he were quite unconcerned, looking at the governor and not so much as glancing at Askyonov. Askyonov's lips and hands trembled, and for a long time he could not utter a word. He thought, why should I screen him who ruined my life? Let him pay for what I have suffered. But if I tell, they will probably flog the life out of him, and maybe I suspect him wrongly. And after all, what good would it be to me? Well, old man, repeated the governor, tell me the truth. Who has been digging under the wall? Askyonov glanced at Makar Semyonich and said, I cannot say, your honor. It is not God's will that I should tell. Do what you like with me. I am in your hands. However much the governor tried, Askyonov would say no more, and so the matter had to be left. That night, when Askyonov was lying on his bed and just beginning to doze, 
Someone came quietly and sat down on his bed. He peered through the darkness and recognized Makar. What more do you want of me? asked Askionov. Why have you come here? Makar Semyonitch was silent. So Askionov sat up and said, What do you want? Go away, or I will call the guard. Makar Semyonitch bent close over Askionov and whispered, Ivan Dmitrich. Forgive me. What for? asked Askionov. It was I who killed the merchant and hid the knife among your things. I meant to kill you too, but I heard a noise outside, so I hid the knife in your bag and escaped out of the window. Askionov was silent and did not know what to say. Makar Semyonitch slid off the bed shelf and knelt upon the ground. Ivan Dmitrich said he, forgive me, for the love of God, forgive me. I will confess that it was I who killed the merchant, and you will be released and can go to your home. It is easy for you to talk, said Askionov, but I have suffered for you these twenty-six years. Where could I go to now? My wife is dead, and my children have forgotten me. I have nowhere to go. Makar Semyonitch did not rise, but beat his head on the floor. Ivan Dmitrich, forgive me, he cried. When they flogged me with the knout, it was not so hard to bear as it is to see you now. Yet you had pity on me and did not tell. For Christ's sake, forgive me, wretch that I am. And he began to sob. When Askyanov heard him sobbing, he too began to weep. God will forgive you, said he. Maybe I am a hundred times worse than you. And at these words his heart grew light, and the longing for home left him. He no longer had any desire to leave the prison, but only hoped for his last hour to come. In spite of what Askyonov had said, Makar Semyonitch confessed his guilt. But when the order for his release came, Askyonov was already dead. Thank you for joining the Seagull Project for Great Souls, the Russian Troika. Shout out to the performers, Alexander Tavares, Rob Burgess, and Charles Leggett. And an extra big shout out to you, our patrons, for supporting the sharing of these powerful stories. Be sure to give a donation if you like what you heard. Check out our other podcasts and keep your ears peeled for other content coming soon. Until then, keep telling stories. <laughs>